It was January 7th in 1610 when Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei made an astonishing discovery using his homemade telescope. Four moons orbiting the planet Jupiter. By the way, these days you can make your own version of his telescope using cardboard tubes, lenses, and some super glue. The main point of this DIY telescope is to place two lenses at the correct distance from each other. You'll need two lenses. One lens should be concave, the other one convex. So one lens is curved out and the other one is curved in. Galileo's initial telescope was able to magnify objects approximately eight times. He continued to improve it until it reached about 20 times the magnifying power. But let's get back to the main story, shall we? When he first looked at those four moons of Jupiter, he believed he was simply looking at a bunch of stars. But he soon noticed that these space objects seemed to be moving in a regular pattern. It took him a couple of weeks to figure out that what he was looking at were not stars, but moons circling Jupiter. Galileo initially named those moons 1, 2, 3, and 4. But let's face it, those weren't the most creative names. As more moons in our galaxy were discovered later, the numerical system for naming them became confusing and impractical. So it lasted for just a few centuries. So, these days, those four satellites, Jupiter's largest, are named Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They're collectively known as the Galilean moons to honor the man who first noticed them. Galileo's discovery was crucial for our later understanding of astronomy. It was initially believed that other objects revolved around the Earth since it was seen as the center of the universe. We now know that there are hundreds of moons in our solar system. However, large moons, like those discovered by Galileo Galilei, are not so commonly stumbled upon. A moon is considered large when it's the size of our planet or bigger. Ganymede, for instance, is bigger than Mercury. We basically call Ganymede a moon just because it orbits Jupiter. Otherwise, it has all the other characteristics of a planet. It's no surprise that Jupiter has the biggest moons in the area. It beats all the other planets in our solar system in both size and mass. So no wonder it pulled in a lot of other objects towards it. Jupiter is believed to have in total almost 80 moons, with only 53 of them being given official names until today. The first of those Jupiterian moons to be discovered by Galileo was Io. What sets it apart is the fact that it has a lot of volcanoes. Io is the only space object to have active volcanoes in our solar system, apart from Earth. It's also nicknamed the Moon of Fire and Ice because of its sulfur dioxide snowfields. Io's outer layer is splotchy, featuring multiple colors like orange, black, yellow, white, and red. That's probably the reason why NASA described it as a giant pizza covered with melted cheese and splotches of tomato and ripe olives. Because of that sulfur though, Io doesn't smell that appetizing, something similar to a rotten egg. There are more than 100 mountains on the surface of this moon. They are a lot larger than those we see on Earth, some being bigger than Mount Everest. On average, these mountains are 4 miles tall and 98 miles long. Because of those active volcanoes and the intense radiation on Io, there's little chance that life as we know it could exist here. But hey, who's to say it can't have life the way we don't know it? Next on the list of Galilean moons is Europa, the smallest of the four. It's comparable in size to the moon. Europa has an entirely icy surface, with just a bunch of craters scattered here and there. Because of that outer layer, Europa is very reflective, making it one of the brightest moons out there. As for its age, scientists believe its surface to be somewhere between 20 to 180 million years old. Europa is about 4.5 billion years old. What lies beneath that icy surface is impressive. It may even hold the secret to life outside Earth. Ice forms here in two ways. The first is through congelation, a rather self-explanatory process. Ice just grows as the surrounding environment gets colder and colder. 
The other method, though, is a lot more fascinating. A layer of supercooled water found under the ice shell reacts when agitated. It then generates these crystals that make it look like it's snowing in reverse, floating upwards to the ice sheet they sit under. You can recreate this environment yourself at home. Take a bottle of purified water and place it into the freezer. If you don't have purified water anywhere near, just boil some water a couple of times to get rid of as many impurities as possible. Since there won't be any particles inside, once in the freezer, it won't turn solid. But if you take the bottle out of the freezer and give it a shake, the impact will make the water rapidly crystallize, transforming it into a slush-like consistency. There may be water on Europa, but there's little evidence so far that life exists on this moon. However, it's one of the highest candidates in the solar system for potential habitability. Some sort of life forms could adapt to live there in its under ice ocean. That environment is most likely similar to what we can find in our planet's hydrothermal vents hidden deep within our oceans. The amount of oxygen in Europa's atmosphere is very little, but in 2013, NASA gave away some cool evidence. This yet again supports the theory that there is potential for life on this moon. It seems that Europa might be venting water into space. If this is confirmed by future observations, it could also mean that Europa is geologically active. It could also come in handy if we'd manage to study water sources one day. The largest of those Galilean moons is Ganymede. It's also the biggest moon in our solar system altogether. It's a low-density space object similar to Mercury in size, but having only half of its mass. However, Ganymede is the only moon out there to feature its own magnetic field. It's quite small though, and we can barely notice it from Earth since it's overshadowed by Jupiter's much more powerful magnetic field. Another cool aspect of Ganymede is that its atmosphere contains oxygen. Don't get too excited, it's not nearly enough to support any life forms living there. Back in December 2021, a 50-second audio clip was released, which was previously recorded by NASA's probe on its Ganymede flyby. For the inexperienced, the sounds were more similar to those of an old dial-up internet connection. But because of its quirky tunes, Ganymede was soon nicknamed Jupiter's Singing Moon. Finishing up the list of Galilean moons is Callisto, or the most heavily cratered object in our solar system. What's interesting about this moon is that its landscape has barely changed since it formed, and scientists are still debating why this is happening. Most other space objects go through loads of changes throughout their lifetimes because of events such as collisions with other objects, changes in orientation or speed, or chemical reactions happening on their surface. Callisto is also about the size of the planet Mercury, but it has a lower density. Jupiter's magnetic field has a lesser impact here, since Callisto is the furthest from the giant planet. Its surface is estimated to be a staggering 4 billion years old. As opposed to Io, Callisto is not geologically active, but scientists believe there might be an ocean hiding underneath the moon's surface, which may potentially harbor life. The fact that it's less impacted by Jupiter's magnetic field means that it features low levels of radiation. Given this suitable environment, we may one day end up setting a human base for future explorations here. It all started with a minor change on our planet. At first, people noticed the moon had become brighter and a little bigger. But nobody paid attention to this. The moon affected tides all over the world. The water flooded the beaches, but it wasn't a tragedy. A lot of fish came close to the shores. People found giant squid, anglerfish, and other creatures next to the coast, although they usually live in the dark depths. New, stranger things happen every day. Birds no longer fly to the south in winter. They gather in huge groups flying around cities with no purpose. The moon used to help them navigate in nature, so they can't figure out which way to fly anymore. In the boundless waters of the world's oceans, Ship captains notice that compasses are now unstable. The arrow is pointing in different directions since the Earth's magnetic poles have changed. 
people realize the moon has started to approach Earth for an unknown reason. The moon's gravity affects the gravity of our planet. This entails changes in the climate, the behavior of all living beings, and the magnetic field. Now, it rains in the driest places and gets hot in the coldest lands. It's knocking down ecosystems all over the planet. People living near forests hear wolves howling all the time. The moon drives these animals mad. The Earth's natural satellite is growing in size and lights up the night much brighter. Nothing critical has happened yet. People don't panic because they don't want to believe the end is coming. But then, one day, the moon reaches a critical point. You're walking down the street listening to music. And at that moment, someone pushes you. Okay, maybe that guy is late for work. You keep walking, and a girl coming by hits your shoulder. I'm sorry, she says, and goes away. You've noticed the fear in her eyes. You look ahead and see people running towards you. You take off your headphones and hear screams and sirens. People leave their cars and run away. Hundreds of seagulls are flying in the sky. You hear a strange noise among all the sounds of chaos. It seems to be water. How is this possible? You're in the city center, a few miles from the shore. But there's no time to think. You notice a huge wave flooding the streets and heading straight to you. You run into a building and go up to the 10th floor. From here, you're watching the water filling the city. The strong stream blows all cars, one-story buildings, and trees off the road. You notice a shark and other fish in the water. People are hiding in houses and on the roofs. The whole city is quickly plunging into a catastrophe. The TV is working in the building where you're hiding. You learn that floods are occurring all over the world. Massive tsunamis cover coastal cities. In some places, waves reach the height of a 30-story building. Many towns have been washed off the face of the Earth. The moon is too close to Earth, and massive floods are just the beginning. The moon flies around Earth and helps to keep our home on its axis. The moon provides climate stability and helps living organisms develop. But now, this balance is broken. The moon is approaching and changing our planet's gravity. Earth can tilt slightly to the side and provoke massive floods around the world. Imagine that you're holding a round glass of water. Tilt it a little. See how the liquid moves from one side to another? The same thing is happening now with the oceans. But the moon is not just approaching us. It's flying around the planet and getting closer with each circle. It causes natural disasters in different locations on Earth all the time. Now the ocean floods one side and a few hours later, another. So, you see all the water going back from the streets to the shore. The oceans may return to the city again by the end of the day. Wait a minute. It seems the end of the day has already come. You notice that the sky has become dark. It's weird, because it's only 3 p.m. The moon changes Earth's rotation speed and makes the day go faster. The moon covers almost the entire sky and brightly illuminates our planet. You see huge lunar craters. It's so close that you can still see it even when the sun shines. In some places, the passing moon obscures the sun. The water is leaving the streets and everyone goes outside. At this moment, an earthquake begins. The road is cracking and the houses are collapsing. There are landslides on the street. Tectonic plates are shifting all over the planet. Imagine two magnetic balls that are approaching each other. So, one ball is the moon, and the second one is Earth's core. What do you think will happen to what's above the core? That's hundreds of thousands of miles of the Earth's crust. And now, it's all moving. Destructive cracks are emerging all over the world. The planet's highest mountains break down and turn into a pile of stones. The seabed cracks and releases magma from the underground depths. Volcanoes wake up and erupt magma. Clouds of volcanic ash cover the sky from the sun and the glowing moon. But the scariest thing is still ahead. A collision is inevitable. The moon flies around the planet like a ball in a round glass with a hole in the center. This force drives clouds all over the planet. Now there's a thunderstorm, but in five minutes, it will be snowing. 
Then the night comes, and it starts raining. Water droplets consist of mud and volcanic ash. It's difficult for people to breathe without gas masks. Atmospheric pressure is constantly changing. Some people experience severe migraines, and some have sore joints. But there's no time to think about your health. Humanity needs to figure out how to save itself from the collision. A new gravitational order will come when the moon crashes into Earth. Continents will change their shape. They will combine into one giant piece of land or split into a hundred smaller ones. The energy of the collision can burn all the oxygen in the atmosphere and make the planet unsuitable for life. Hiding underground also makes no sense because of deep earthquakes. People decide to spend their last hours with loved ones and their families. The moon is getting closer. It's now at the same distance as the International Space Station. The moon covers the sky. Many cities are in the shadows because of the waves. Tsunamis, several miles in height, crash down on the ground. Millions of tons of magma collide with the ocean. Billions of gallons of water just evaporate. Moisture rises into the air, mixes with ash, and floods the land in the form of giant cumulus clouds. You've accepted the complete destruction of the planet. But something strange happens to the moon at this moment. You notice giant cracks appear on it. The moon slowly begins to divide into two parts. Both halves crumble into hundreds of large pieces. It's just falling apart. The Earth doesn't have a natural satellite anymore. It's just a pile of giant space rocks. But why is this happening? There's a space around our planet called the Roche Limit. In this place, the gravity of Earth is stronger than that of the Moon. This means that the forces holding the Moon together are weaker than those that tear it apart. People are cheering. The Roche Limit has saved the planet. The Moon won't hit us. It breaks up into millions of fragments and forms a circle around our globe. Now, Earth looks like Saturn. A belt of moonstones surrounds us. Huge chunks destroy everything in their path, all the space debris. The satellites are no longer working. Humanity loses its means of communication and navigation. People will have to use paper maps again. The moon held our planet's orbit at a certain angle before these events. Now the axis is tilted differently. One hemisphere becomes closer to the sun, and the other plunges into shadow. The North Pole and the Arctic may turn into hot deserts, and the equator of the planet may be covered with ice. Winter and summer can last for years. The moon's remnants fly around Earth, but some of them fall on our planet. Lunar meteor showers destroy cities and create giant craters. All these events lead to the massive destruction of life on Earth. It will take hundreds of thousands of years to adapt to the new world. Have you ever seen the other side of the moon? Ah, I caught you. Of course not. But maybe you've seen it in photos. In that case, have you ever wondered why the two sides look so different? Well, let me tell you. We can't see the other side of the moon. People believe this is because the moon doesn't rotate around its axis. But this is not true. The moon does rotate. It just does it at the same rate as its orbital motion. This is a particular case of tidal locking called synchronous rotation. The first time we ever saw a far side was only in 1959, all thanks to the Soviet Luna missions and later the US Apollo program. Now, when Luna 3 and other spacecraft transmitted the first far side images, they revealed a far more cratered hemisphere that looked more like Mercury or Jupiter's moon Callisto. It looked completely different from what we were used to. And that's when we learned how meh the other side is. No, seriously, just look at it. The near side can boast its thinner and smoother crust. These beautiful dark splotches are called lunar mare, the last remnants of ancient lava flows. And when I say ancient, I mean it. They're more than 3 billion years old. Meanwhile, the far side crust is thicker and crater pocked. The lava flows had almost no effect on these impact craters. It's also devoid of any large-scale mare. Low-key looks like dried white cheese. To be honest, don't you agree that the nearby side is much more beautiful? Write your thoughts in the comments. So, only 50 years ago, we learned something about the apparent differences. 
But then the scientists discovered something weird. Both sides are different, even in the geochemical composition. And not only in this. Our side was thinner than the far side by several miles. But where did such significant differences come from on an ordinary floating stone ball? For scientists, this was a mystery. They started coming up with a lot of theories. The melted moon theory was the main one for a while. It said that it was the Earth's fault that our moon looks like this. This happened several billion years ago. The moon was born because of a collision. One day, an object about the size of Mars crashed into the Earth. At that moment, a piece broke off from it, which later became the moon. However, this piece was somewhere 15 times closer to Earth than it is now. Some scientists created pictures of the so-called early moon. Unlike our cute little white ball, the early moon was a strange-looking boiling scarlet ball. That piece didn't leave us after the separation. It became tidally locked very soon after. The Earth after the collision was still an incandescent nightmare, full of fire and lava. It was boiling at a temperature of 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And since the Moon has always been turned toward us with one side, this side has melted down a little. This would explain why the Moon's surface, the so-called mantle, is thinner on the near side than on the far side. During the boiling of the Earth, certain elements evaporated from it. They then settled on the Moon. This would explain the difference in geochemical composition between the two sides. But there was a plot hole in this theory. If that's what happened, then where did rare foreign chemical elements come from, such as unusual isotopes of phosphorus, potassium, or tungsten? The nearby site is full of them, and they couldn't have come from the Earth. There were also other theories. Another one said that initially, we had two teeny tiny moons. Later, they merged into a big one, hence the difference in their composition. But this theory sounds a bit crazy, and it has a plot hole too. For example, the transition between the two sides is way too soft. If our moon was actually two tiny moons, this transition would be more abrupt. So scientists were kind of at a loss on this one. But recently, they finally figured out what really happened to the moon, all thanks to NASA's GRAIL orbiters. They spent over a year whizzing around the moon, mapping it out, and studying its composition. Using this data, scientists have created around 360 computer simulations. They contain different impacting objects of many sizes traveling at different speeds. Scientists were comparing the results with our current moon. They tried to determine which result was the closest to what we have today. And so, they finally solved this 50-year-old mystery. The answer lies in a collision with a dwarf planet. This collision occurred 4.3 billion years ago. This huge object was slightly larger than Ceres. For those who don't know, Ceres is one of the dwarf planets of our solar system. Its diameter is 580 miles. You could say that one France or one Germany would fit into it. So, this giant object crashed into the moon, somewhere near the South Pole. This collision was so strong that it changed the image of the moon forever. It left a trail of 3,500 miles behind. It would take you 14 hours by plane to fly that distance. This crater covered the entire near side of the moon. It caused damage to the moon's mantle. It also created a so-called South Pole Aiken Base, or SPA Basin. This is an impact crater and has a diameter of 1,600 miles, which is like adding one UK plus one Germany. It's important, though. The formation of this basin was a defining event in the history of the moon, and it's the second largest impact crater in the solar system. The collision also caused a powerful hot wave to spread across the moon. This wave scattered over the remnants of those rare, warm minerals scientists found on the nearby side. That's how our beautiful side became home to something called Procellarum creep terrain, or PKT for short. This is basically a compositional anomaly, a concentration of potassium, phosphorus, and other rare elements like thorium. You can say that those minerals are a gift to us from deep space. Anyway, there were many, and I mean many, collisions in the moon's history. All of them only deepened this already large crater. That's why the mantle on the near side was getting thinner and thinner with the years. 
Also, our gifted minerals gave off a lot of heat, so the mantle has melted a little bit more and more. Oops, this accidentally caused the moon's volcanoes to wake up. Volcanic activity has increased on the near side. Intense lava flows filled the old empty craters. Ta-da! And this is how the beautiful lunar Mare was born. Uh, that's about how it all happened. All this information was found thanks to the researchers from Brown, Purdue, Stanford Universities, and NASA's JPL. The research was published by the Journal of Geophysical Research, Planets. So you can read about it in more detail if you're interested. There are still many things we need to learn about the Moon. The highest priority is the return mission from the South Pole, the Aitken Basin. Samples brought from there will be used to determine the age of the Moon, its history, and the nature of the crust and mantle more accurately. Another critical target is the Moskovians. This is the name of a large lava plain on the far side of the Moon. Studying it will help us better understand the difference between the two sides, as well as tell us how the other side was formed. All this knowledge is significant for understanding the history of the Moon. But it's also handy for space exploration in general. Scientists use the Moon as a reference point to determine the age of other planets and entire worlds in space. The Moon helps us determine the chronology of the life of the whole solar system. So stay tuned for new exciting research and discoveries!